Financial Services. He received Shiromani Award for National Development and Integration and the Priyamani Priyadarshini Award for Outstanding Public Service. His services as a Municipal Commissioner of Bombay earned him the Gaines International Award in the year 1991. He is the only one who was the chairman for both the Air India and Indian uh, Airlines. Sri Padmanabhaya served the government of Maharashtra in a variety of important positions like Director of Sugar Cooperatives, Principal Secretary Planning, Finance and others. And also he served as the Government of India as Joint Secretary Petroleum, Power, Secretary Urban Development and Housing. As Union Home Secretary, he played an extremely crucial role in reviving Jammu and Kashmir state's political process during 1994 to 1997 and holding the very first election in the insurgency ridden state after a gap of nine years. After uh, retirement from his service in 1997, he was appointed as the Government of India representative for Naga Peace Talks. With this introduction, I welcome you, sir, for introductory remarks. Thank you. Long introduction, you know, which was not necessary. Uh, I join my colleague uh, uh, Nirmalya Bhakti in welcoming our distinguished speaker today, Professor Vijay Raghavan. Now, his uh, bio data has been given. I must say he has a wonderful pedigree as far as his academic uh, achievements go. Uh, he, he's a, he started as a chemical engineer and subsequently specialized in molecular biology and the developmental genetics. And, um, and he joined chemical technology. I think IIT was, Kanpur was supposed to be one of the best. Then he joined the California Institute of Technology. Then he got his PhD from AFR and he's a fellow of the Royal Society. So I welcome him very much. I don't want to waste time. I do not know really what exactly Professor Vijay Raghavan is going to speak, but I suspect it would be about the development cycle of vaccines and particularly the uh, COVID vaccine. But I have a couple of points uh, which I would like him to cover in his uh, speech. One is the uh, COVID vaccination program was uh, sort of uh, uh, opened on 16th of January. As of 25th of January, only about 56% of the people eligible to get the shot took it. But this is not unexpected because any time a new vaccine comes, there is some resistance, there is some welcome, and uh, this happens in the, at least in the initial stages. But uh, what, it, what, what is interesting is that the hesitancy or the opposition is coming from a section of the medical community. I would like to know why this medical community is doing this. Uh, they are saying that uh, the data has not been released, whatever is available, there should be more openness and all that. Perhaps he could cover that. The second is, I suspect whether the administrative arrangements for giving vaccine at the last point, uh, at the delivery side, last mile delivery, whether they are adequate, uh, one doubts that. The third one is, the people who get vaccinated, there would be some reactions or whatever it is. I think they should have a free access, free and easy access for the follow-up cases for at least a week after the, this one. That provision should be made when a sort of uh, inoculating or vaccinating these people. The fourth point is this uh, COVID application. People, government has been advertising for the last uh, uh, at least 20, 25 days that please register yourself with the COVID application and all that. I tried three times, including this morning, to uh, sort of uh, download that application and then uh, sign in. But I am not able to do that. Somebody told me that it is still not open to the public. So I think at the proper time, the, the government should give uh, sort of uh, proper instructions on when it is available and who should access that and all that. These are some of the preliminary points I thought I would make. and. Uh, now, uh, Ram Sirish, I, I think instead of getting to you, I can ask Professor Vijay Raghavan to give his speech. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful remarks. It's my honor to invite our esteemed speaker, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Today. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Raghavan to the virtual dia. Sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Ram Sirish, and thank you very much. Mr. Padmanabhaya and uh, Mr. Uh, Nirmalaya Bhakshi, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I have actually a pretty long 
slot for my talk. And I also have some uh, time allotted for questions and answers. But I would prefer that we spend more time uh, on the questions and answers and thereby uh, perhaps to a greater value to the people listening than just a long speech. But I will give you some aspects um, today about what I think are important for us to understand, even as we go ahead towards specifically dealing with vaccines. For us to understand vaccines, we must understand the origin and scope and nature of diseases and how we as humans are able to deal with them or unable to deal with them. Unless we do that, we end up being in a situation where we look upon diseases as something strange and unusual which happens and solutions which are something which comes about by the miracle of science. Both statements are only partly true. Uh, diseases are not always strange and unusual uh, and solutions come from not by a miracle but by very hard and focused work because of our understanding. So let us first understand where we are with respect to human disease. For that, we need to understand where we came from. It is important to keep in mind that all life on Earth, right from the smallest virus to bacteria, up to us or elephants or mammals or uh, other mammals or dinosaurs or whales and so on, all of them have one common origin. The Earth arose about 4.5 billion years ago, and sometimes soon after, the earliest forms of life arose. Those earliest forms of life, let us say as a first approximation, were single cell organisms, and they populate this wall of life substantially even now. Bacteria and other single cell organisms constitute by weight a very large part of life on Earth. What happened later on was that by accident upon accident, over time, these bacteria were hit by the lottery of natural selection and they became, as it were, different kinds of multicellular organisms which we see today. And these are plants, animals, and different varieties of animals, the whole range we see. Now, because of this common origin and because of the shared evolutionary history, all life on Earth has a shared chemistry. And this is very important to keep in mind. You can have a deep understanding of humans by studying the biology of reptiles. You can have a deep understanding of cancer by studying a fruit fly. And the reason for this is the shared chemistry. The chemistry is common in many aspects to many organisms. So we must keep in mind that the diversity of animals, for example, comes because of the fundamental building blocks of biology being used in different ways to build different organisms. In other words, the analogy is towards all airplanes having pretty much the same kind of principle for flight, an aerofoil and an engine, for example, and room for passengers or cargo. But you make different kinds of aircraft by altering the size how the components, the final components are used, but the building blocks for the design are the same. And this is true for much of animal life. And therefore, the worm and the human have very similar kinds of toolkits at the higher level of development and repeated use of components and different use of components in different places can result in the construction of very, very different organisms. So this relatedness is very important. Disease also arose because of a variety of other kinds of reasons. Just as we feed upon products which we have from the environment, plants and animals and so on and so forth, the smallest of organisms or semi-organisms as it were, viruses, bacteria and others, they feed, they get their energy from other organisms. So viruses will infect bacteria, they'll infect other cells, they'll infect humans, they'll infect plants, they infect, uh, infect other you know, animals such as bats and so on and so forth. Now, because these animals and battle with these invaders, 
the invaders will try to propagate as much as they can, and the host will try to defend itself as much as it can, and this results in many outcomes. This results in an outcome where the host can defeat the uh, invader, the invader can defeat the host, but if the invader defeats the host, then it doesn't have the opportunity to go to the next host, so it must defeat the host after it has gone to the next host, or sometimes they live in symbiosis together. If you go to our air passages and our gut, there will be millions and millions of bacteria and viruses of all kinds there living happily with us, living on our skin, living on all our surfaces. This is normal and this is the way life is. Sometimes what happens is something called zoonosis, a spillover from other animals to us. Viruses, for example, can live very happily in some animals such as bats. The SARS coronavirus too lived in bats very happily. And the reason it lives there without causing damage to the bat is that the bat's immune system is calibrated so that it doesn't overreact to the invading viruses. And its high metabolic activity because of its flight allows uh, the, the bat to be a very nice incubator for the um, virus to survive. So the virus and bat live happily there. Now remember, just as you got a very wide range of plants and animals and multicellular organisms by evolution, viruses also evolve. They rapidly keep changing their sequences because of different kinds of reasons. One, there is an error in the proofreading uh, mechanisms of their replication. So sometimes that error gets through and is not corrected, but they can also shuttle their uh, genetic material between each other and exchange, so by like shuffling a pack of cards and become different. Now, this normally results in viruses which are worse adapted than what they started with for their host. So they will not succeed and they will not enter into their host's population more than their predecessor viruses were. Sometimes what happens is that these viruses take over and are, they dominate their host but even rarer sometimes when they come into contact with another organism such as humans, they have, because of this lottery of variation, they have the ability to spill over and infect a human. Typically that spillover causes problems for that human. It can be mild or serious. And that human then, you know, deals with it by fighting against this invader through their immune system. Sometimes the change in the virus is such that it not only infects the human, but human to human transmission also happens, right? So the key, which is the virus, fits into the lock, which is the human cell in such a manner that it can infect the human cell. This same lock was there in the bat cell. So that's how it infected the bat. So this is part of our evolution, our shared evolution with the bat, that we have the same kind of lock that the bat has. But the virus can alter the key so slightly that not only does it infect the human cell, but it can propagate inside the human cell, amplify, and then infect another human cell or another human. And this is how the spread occurs. When this spread occurs, two things happen. The human, of course, is infected and shows sometimes the symptoms of that infection. It could be fever, it could be respiratory disease, other problems. When it's a virus like Ebola, it could be very severe blood hemorrhaging, and all these things happen. Now, before the human succumbs to the disease, if it's a fatal disease, the virus then is transmitted to another person. So it keeps going, despite it causing damage to the human. Sometimes, such as SARS coronavirus 2, and this is one of the reasons for its huge spread, you can have people who are asymptomatic also transmitting. So it's not just people with symptoms who transmit. You have to identify asymptomatic people if you want to quell the transmission. So the SARS coronavirus 2, by all guesses, spilled over from bats to humans. How that exactly happened, when that exactly happened, we don't know. But because of the asymptomatic nature, it was transmitted all over the world before it could be apprehended. 
It was apprehended first by the publication of the genomic sequence of the virus. That allowed people to now start detecting it both by using RT-PCR or such like tests, both in symptomatic people and their asymptomatic contacts. Now, this is a very important way because it allows isolation and people can uh, you know, be away from each other and one can control the spread. Now this huge spread also resulted because the way the virus infects us, in most cases it causes no problem, especially in younger people. In older people, it can cause very severe problems in a small fraction and uh, leading to even lethality and morbidity in many others. So it's a very unusual disease in that it has very little symptoms and very severe symptoms. It affects people very mildly or also very severely. It affects the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. And, you know, it seems to travel very fast before symptoms come about, so its spread is very rapid. And that's why it caused a sudden exponential rise and a loading of the health system all over the country. And then that those systems were very stretched and caused a serious problem. Now, what is the way out of this? There are two ways out of pandemics such as this. One is drugs, the other vaccines. And the third, by the way, is something which one has to practice for any respiratory illness, which is social distancing and masks. Drugs have a challenge. Drugs against a virus have to act early because if it acts late, the virus has replicated so much that drugs don't have time to have their impact. Drugs come with enormous side effects normally. And in this case, even more so because it's very difficult to target only the virus's machinery because the viruses use our machinery substantially to replicate. Therefore, a drug which uniquely trans, um, um, attacks the, uh, the virus, but not our cells, is very difficult to make. So drugs are difficult to make because they attack both the virus and our cells. And when they do, they have to be deployed very, very early. And in an asymptomatic disease, if the drug has side effects, you can't give it to all of the population as a prophylactic. So drugs are a challenge, but drugs are very useful and they have proven to be very useful in the pandemic for later stage interventions where the virus is no longer present, but the symptoms of the disease cause havoc. And one drug such as dexamethasone, which is a steroid which reduces the cytokine storm has been very, very valuable. Now vaccines are another route out and vaccines are not a route which is obvious to work. There have been many major diseases for which vaccines have been unable to be made. Tuberculosis is one, malaria is another, HIV AIDS is a third. So these are illnesses where vaccines have, there have been vaccine recalcitrant for a variety of immunological and uh, other reasons which relate to the virus or the bacteria or the parasite. Fortunately, vaccines against SARS coronavirus 2 seem to be working. Now vaccines are of multiple kinds, but before that, what does a vaccine do? When you get infected by a virus, there are multiple levels of immunity which act against the virus. One is something called innate immunity, which is not specific to the virus. In other words, it attacks every kind of invading uh, pathogen, and that tries to you know, deal with a way by which the virus is swallowed up and taken for destruction. That's a very crude frontline uh, defense and it works only to a certain extent. But there's also in the mucus uh, antibodies present and these can be used to combat the virus if they are the right type, but it takes a while to develop this mucosal immunity in a specific manner against the uh, uh, invading virus. So once you're infected, the next time you might have mucosal in immunity, and I'll come to that. But once the virus enters cells, then the immune system starts breaking up the virus into components and recognizing these components and asking specific kinds of cells to make antibodies against the viral components or other kinds of cells to make what are called memory um, molecules against the virus. So these antibodies and these memory molecules 
uh, they both attack the virus, swallow it, and take it for destruction. And they can be effect, effective in combating the illness, or the virus might overwhelm the immune system and escape. In any case, after the person recovers, should there be a subsequent infection, then these kinds of immune systems are primed to attack the virus again, and a second round of infection usually doesn't take place. Vaccines work much the same way. What you do is, instead of actually infecting with a virus, you infect with something which has components of the virus, and then prime the immune system so that it is ready for a response afterwards. Indeed, the earliest vaccines were attenuated viruses or bacteria which had very low uh, 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 virulence, but at the same time had the surface components, same as the major virus, and therefore could you be used to elicit an immune response. So when you're actually infected by the virus, then you are prepared. So smallpox is a good example of how an attenuated virus was used to prepare vaccines. Now, in today's world, how do we make vaccines? Traditionally, vaccines were made much the same way as a smallpox vaccine. People searched for viruses or bacteria which had very low virulence and therefore did not hurt the person who was injected with it, but at the same time, bolster their immune system. So vaccines against plague, against cholera, against typhoid, were all developed in a similar manner. Another route people took was to inactivate the virus or the bacteria. You could kill that by using a chemical or heat and then inject so that the surface components were still there to elicit an immune response. And you, know, you could have a response when the pathogen actually invaded us. You wanted to stimulate the immune response. So you often tagged this mixture with something called an adjuvant which stimulated the immune response. And adjuvants are mysterious, as well as some are very clearly defined. And these compounds are co-injected with the vaccine. So you had inactivated uh, viruses, for example, or attenuated viruses. And with the advent of genetic engineering, other methods were used. One is to use a vector to put into that vector a component of the virus we're interested in making antibodies against. So you could use, for example, vectors which infect, you know, humans, adenovirus vectors or chimpanzee vectors, which have been sort of decapacitated so that they are not harmful to us, but they serve as vehicles for the transport of viral genetic material, a component of it, so that that's not harmful to us. But when you inject this virus inside, it can replicate inside our body but make the components of, for example, the SARS coronavirus 2 against which you raise antibody. So that's one way of doing it. So vectored vaccines are another way, apart from the attenuated vaccines or the inactivated vaccines. You can also make in large amounts viral proteins, the surface components of virus in the laboratory and use that to make vaccines. And more recently, people have made the genetic material of components of the virus, which code for components of the virus, and use that either as RNA or DNA to inject, to make uh, the body make these components and raise an immune system against it. In India, we've had many attempts at making a vaccine and some successful and others in the pipeline. And this is very impressive. India is known to be an extraordinary exporter of vaccines. And indeed, in the UNESCO program, two out of three vaccines, which every child receives anywhere in the world, is made in India. India has also has a long history of making vaccines, right from the Hafkin Institute uh, vaccines against cholera and plague, to vaccines which against rabies in the Pasteur Institutes, and more recently, vaccines, the rotavirus vaccines, the cholera, the rabies vaccines, the typhoid vaccines, meningococcal vaccines, uh, you name it, India has been making these vaccines and exploring them, exporting them uh, all over the world. Uh, so this is a great tradition of making vaccines. But in addition, India now has embarked on really discovery research to develop vaccines. Now, the Oxford Zeneca um, vaccine in collaboration with Serum Institute is a adenovirus, chimp adenovirus vaccine 
which has been approved for emergency use both in the UK and India, and will soon get emergency use, one understands, in the EU. And Serum Institute is one of the largest suppliers of vaccines, so this vaccine will be very widely used. Um, another vaccine which has got emergency use authorization in India is the Bharat Biotech vaccine, the Covaxin, and that is made by a uh, inactivated virus, the sars cov virus grown in huge amounts in the laboratory, is inactivated chemically so that it has absolutely no viral activity and with what, I, what is called an adjuvant is used as a vaccine. It has gone through very rigorous safety trials, very rigorous animal trials which show efficacy in animals uh, in non-human primates and it has gone through phase one and phase two trials which show both safety and immunogenicity. The phase three trials which will show both enhanced safety as well as um, uh, efficacy will come in very soon. Now, these two vaccines were authorized by the Drug Controller General of India, keeping in mind not just the stages they were in, but they were given emergency use because looking at the state of the pandemic, unless vaccines are rolled out on large levels, there would be a danger that we would not be able to get out of it. It is true that the levels of prevalence are low right now, but we must not be complacent because if you look at places like the UK or Manaus in Brazil, low levels at some points can dramatically change to high levels, given that even with a significant part of the population having had experience of the disease, there are large pockets which don't have and new variants might take over the space. In the there are other Indian vaccines which are being developed, which are also very good. Zydus Kerala's vaccine has gone on to phase three. Then there is Genova, which is making an mRNA vaccine. Premus, which is making what is called a multiple open reading frame vaccine with multiple parts of the viral protein. Minvax, which is making a room temperature vaccine. And very important companies such as Bharat Bio, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Reddy's lab collaborating with the Russian uh, Sputnik vaccine, which has also gone to phase three. And Biological E collaborating both with uh, with uh, making their own vaccine and collaborating with the Baylor College to develop vaccine. The Serum Institute is also collaborating with Novavax for another vaccine. So this early phase of limited vaccine availability will change very rapidly in the second quarter to substantial availability. As we go to vaccinate from the healthcare workers and the frontline workers to the group of 30 crores above 50 years of age, we'll have multiple vaccines and multiple ways of vaccination. Now, Mr. Padmanabhaya, I had a few questions. And the very simple point is that vaccine hesitancy is not unusual, it's common. Uh, and it's picking, uh, the use of vaccines is picking up rather substantially now. Just as, you know, before the vaccines came and everyone was demanding vaccines, suddenly when vaccines are available, there will be concerns. Now, it's important to keep in mind that there are absolutely no concerns about the safety of these vaccines. Uh, there will be side effects. Those are relatively standard side effects. They're very, very few compared to the side effects of just living. By us living, we'll have all sorts of problems every day. And in 100,000 people, a million people, or in cores of people, without any vaccination, many things happen to a fraction of this population. They have illnesses, some die, some have you know, headaches, stomach aches, and so on. So when you vaccinate immediately after that in hundreds of thousands of people, you will see many of these things happening. So what we need to do is to communicate and ask that these are, by the way, all of them are called adverse events following immunization, but they are not adverse events caused by immunization. There is a difference. Each adverse events following immunization is investigated very rapidly and check whether it is caused by immunization or not. And so far, for all the vaccines here, as well as those abroad, there are very, very few examples of adverse events caused by immunization. For some of the mRNA vaccines, it seems that people who have already have allergies, such as to peanuts, uh, to you know, bee stings or wasps stings, and get anaphylactic shock, need to be careful. But otherwise, there is no uh, cause for concern about safety. We must keep in mind 
that the safety trials are very robust and very strong, but they are limited to tens of thousands of people. The actual use will go into millions of people. So only then do we see in the post-market licensure of every vaccine, very, very rare events potentially coming up. And we must keep a watch for it, but there's absolutely no substantial danger and any potential side effect is much, much, much less than what we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. Mr. Padmanabhaya raised the question about the COVID application. Right now, the application, uh, this point is very important and well taken, and I'll convey it to those who are making the app. The public boarding of people on that application will start when the over 50 age group also has access to vaccines. Right now, it is frontline workers and healthcare workers. And as that program rolls into um, its next few days, then the onboarding of others will start. So that will be available soon. It will also be available both in Android as well as the uh, Apple Store. Right now, I think it's available only in Android. I need to check. And uh, so that may be a kind of issue. But that issue will be sorted out uh, as one goes ahead. Right now, the frontline workers and healthcare workers again. But that's a technical matter which I need to check and get back. So I think I will stop here and I look forward to hearing questions and comments from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for the informative talk on vaccine development in India. So now it is the time for the question and answer session. And you may please post your questions uh, through the chat window for our guest to answer. Sir, I received one question. Uh, for vaccinating people, shouldn't India focus on clusters and regions where CFR is high or uh, regions with high population uh, densities? For instance, a young person in Mumbai without medical conditions might be more eligible beneficiary than someone from the military, say from Manipur. So the question is, should one calibrate the distribution of vaccines in a geographic manner. Now, the calibration of distribution is done in coordination with different state governments, and this is precisely the kind of outcome. One is not rushing vaccines disproportionately to places where they are needed the most. This is an early stage where the supply of vaccines is relatively modest, and it's for healthcare workers and frontline workers. Please keep that in mind. And all of those category of people will very rapidly get it across the country because they are dealing, they are the front line dealing with other people who are likely to be unwell and they have to be protected. The more general aspect about where, as we go on to the next set, which is people above 50 years of age, there the level of prevalence becomes very important. They, again, there are two kinds. You know, we need to be in places which have, there are two kinds of arguments. One is in places which have not been exposed to the disease at all. Shouldn't those who are vulnerable with morbidities and who are older people be protected? Rather than those in places where the disease has already spread and the younger people who are likely to transmit to the older people may have already been infected. Now, this is all a theoretical debate because in practice, you have a situation where cities are not well mixed tubs. One part of the city can have a high prevalence and another part can have a low prevalence. The cost of doing detailed zero prevalence studies to decide which part should be, in, uh, to be vaccinated first and which part later are overwhelming. It's far easier to produce vaccines on scale and roll out, and that is what is going to happen. Thank you, sir. And one more question from Mr. Pavan Chawla, student of PGDM. Uh, I will be getting vaccinated at an earliest opportunity, but I'm wondering if I will be able to receive future vaccines if a more effective or the targeted version become available. Are vaccines in development now are cross compatible? Why would you want future vaccines against SARS coronavirus 2 when you've been vaccinated using one which is effective? Now, this is a very important question. Should you get vaccinated? you will have immunity against the virus. The question is, how long will that immunity last? It looks, because we don't know, it's a new disease. Guesses are that a vaccine will last for a year, maybe two, maybe more. We don't know. 
Does the virus change? If so, how much? How long does your immunity last? If so, how long? These are parameters which will be clear over some time. Should there be a situation that you need periodic booster doses of a vaccine? In principle, there is no problem in getting a booster dose a year later or two years later of some other vaccine from some other platform. That's in principle not a problem. Uh, so that's not particularly an issue. It's a hypothetical point right now, but it's not a particular issue. One more question from Mr. So from Subir Majumdar, how to decide which vaccine works best and serves the cost longer? How to decide which vaccine works the best and second longer. part of it? Serves, uh, serves the cost longer. Right. So the efficacy of a vaccine is measured by vaccinating people uh, in a large trial and giving half the people the vaccine and half the people a placebo. And then you ask where people show symptoms of the disease, how many are from the vaccinated group and how many from the placebo group. So for example, in 100 people who have shown symptoms of the disease, if only three in the vaccinated group show the disease symptoms and 97 in the placebo group show it, you would say the vaccine is 97% effective. And if it's 60%, it's 60% and so on. Now, efficacy in such a trial is usually lower than what the effectiveness is there in the field for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into now. And therefore, you know, the quibbling about whether a vaccine is highly efficacy, uh, has high efficacy or not, is not particularly important when you go into the field, as long as it's above a certain threshold of efficacy, which right now the WHO says is 50%, let's say it's 50% of 60% of water. Why is efficacy important? Because a vaccine which is efficacious in the field immunizes the population faster than the virus infects it, right? So if you give the vaccine to 100 people and if 80 are protected, it's better than if you give it to 100 people and only 40 are protected, right? If you only 40 are protected, you give the vaccine again to the same 100 again, and therefore it's very likely another 40 will be protected. So you give two doses for two reasons. One, to increase the immunity in an individual, but also to increase the basal level of immunity amongst the population. So there are multiple ways given the efficacy of a vaccine of ensuring vaccine-derived herd or community immunity. If that is done, that's important. Now, the virus also can replicate faster and transmit faster, and therefore, that can outcompete the efficacy. So the efficacy is a balance between the speed of transmission and the efficacy internally, uh, intrinsically of the vaccine. So right now, all the vaccines available are pretty much, globally, are pretty much uh, have uh, sufficient efficacy, and any of them can be used. So question from Dr. Sashwat Mishra. In India, there is apparently large scale uh, servo prevalence already. Shouldn't the shouldn't then the individual or corporation who can afford should be allowed to purchase the vaccine at market price in a market with multiple vendors offering vaccination? Can there be a blended approach? So the questions are the multiple questions here which need to be unpacked. Now, to say that in India there is a high seroprevalence is distinct from saying that seroprevalence studies in a few cities across India have shown high seroprevalence in those areas of those cities where the studies have been done. So it is not, again, as I said, that India is a well-mixed tub or each city is a well-mixed tub, but you should see this as multiple rivulets flowing which have you know high seroprevalence in some parts and perhaps low or moderate seroprevalence in others. In other words, to assume that seroprevalence is widespread and protective would be risky for two reasons. We don't know the extent of uh, seroprevalence truly. 
it is significant, but that's important. That provides a certain measure of uh, protection. But we also don't know how new strains will mutate and both affect those who are already exposed and those who are not exposed should something the old or new strains come to a specific location. As I said earlier, vaccination cannot measure on scale, on a community scale, the seroprevalence and decide who should be vaccinated or not. And even those who have been infected, there's a gradation in the level of immunity. Some people, even though they've been moderately uh, infected, may have protection wane earlier, even though now there are promising studies saying that the protection stays on for longer. Others may not, but so you vaccinate everyone. So the point about the private sector is well stated. As we go into the 30 crore level immunization, multiple components, multiple players will of course be involved. And of course, it's only this first stage which the government is paying. And the other stage, not only are others paying, uh, that people who can afford pay, but people who can afford should also help, you know, so subsidize those of their colleagues and friends and you know factory workers and others who cannot afford. So that will of course happen. So next question from Dr. Prakash Rao, KKSVV. Some people are discussing it is an immunity booster and not exactly the vaccine. What is your opinion on that? I'm sorry, people are saying that they should take immunity boosters and not a vaccine? People are saying it is discussing it is an immunity booster, but not the vaccine. So it is only the immunity booster. The vaccine is only an immunity booster. Yeah. What is your opinion on that? Well, I don't know what an immunity booster is. I know what a vaccine is. And a vaccine is mimics the virus. You inject that or you, you know, there could be vaccines which you take orally. And because the immune system sees it as a foreign body, it reacts against it. And there's a memory of this. So when the virus comes, the real virus comes, that memory is activated and amplifies the immune response. So, I mean, the immune system is, of course, boosted in the sense it has a specific, very specific memory and boost. I think what is commonly called immunity boosters are general immune well-being through nutrition and other methods. And that general well-being is not a protection against every kind of viral attack, whereas a vaccine is a protection against every kind of viral attack. Next question from Mr. Ayush Anand. Could delaying the second job compromise the eff efficacy of vaccine? As we know that there, uh, there are two doses to be injected. As I said, the first dose will stimulate an immune system response and there will be a memory of that response. The second dose amplifies that response, but also at a population level, those who have not responded well to the first dose have a chance now to respond well to the second dose. And so there's a broader level of protection. <coughs> How much can you prolong the gap between the first dose and the second dose? We don't know that for sure. We know for sure what the trials have done and therefore amplifying or shortening that period basically doesn't give you information except as a guess. In one vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine trial, the gap was accidentally increased and found to have a you know, reasonable efficacy even after that. And in another example, the first dose was accidentally lowered and the efficacy overall was found to be more. Now, whether these are something which is significant and should be taken as a conclusion, I'm not so sure, because the end points of the trial were not those. These are just indications, and unless there's a rigorous trial, we don't know. But overall, there can be a modest fluctuation in the gap between, the prescribed gap between the first and the second dose, but it's wise not to have too long a gap. There will be in future, very likely, single dose vaccines also coming up, which stimulate the immune system substantially after a single dose. So one question from Mr. Dr. Shashwat. At the global platform, number of rich countries are stocking up more vaccines than their population's requirement. This might put vaccines out of reach for low and middle income countries. India is emerging as a global supplier of vaccines. At this time, global crisis, do you see a scope where India has an opportunity to showcase moral leadership? The world is on the brink of a 
catastrophic moral failure uh there are many things to unpack here while there is a significant level of vaccine nationalism which countries making direct deals with companies instead of using global organizations which prioritize where vaccines have to go uh, that causes a problem and it is true that other countries are stockpiling but i'm not sure whether countries are stockpiling more than they need uh, they might be stockpiling to the extent they need but what is going to be happen is these these kinds of you know vaccine nationalism is not good and india has never done that and india has already uh, not only committed to meeting its export commitments but has been meeting them already uh, and you know it's indian companies of scale which are able to manufacture vaccines both for india and export it's important to remember that it's very silly to protect only one's people and not bother about others because you know given the way travel is you can't open up until everyone is safe and no one is safe till all are safe question from mr pradeep dubale there is an advisory that people with diabetes bp thyroid problem shouldn't take the vaccine what is the alternative for them it's not that they shouldn't take the vaccine these are all indications which one should be careful about and ask the person at the vaccination place whether one can take it remember there are very these are all many of these problems are standard lifestyle issues and there are many who know about it and many who don't know that they have these problems so taking vaccines per se is absolutely no problem but if there are any extreme conditions in these categories you should talk to your doctor and make sure that you can take most likely the answer will be yes and there will be certain caution last question from vikram tummala how can the alternative systems of medicines like homeopathy and ayurveda be used to fight the symptoms or cause of the coronavirus there are many as i said apart from vaccines uh, drugs and therapeutics are very important and they can play a role and these range from a healthy lifestyle to you know various kinds of ways in which you take products which you have uh, a strong view they are valuable or they have been demonstrated to be valuable ayurvedic medicines of various kinds as uh, general health uh, supplements as being valuable against viral illnesses in general or bacterial illnesses these are many such products available and my feeling is that you know you should look at these products and take them in a certain context they are very valuable in those contexts uh, they may not protect against severe disease but we must keep in mind whether it's ayurvedic or allopathic there's no drug which protects against uh, coronavirus infection going to severity they can mitigate somewhat in some cases so it's only the later stages where we have some reasonable candidate drugs and we have vaccines for the early stages now so this is few more questions uh, you will answer them certainly okay. question from mr raja raman ramalingam since covaxin yet to complete stage 3 is it not prudent to test for pre existing antibodies for the beneficiaries so that the data can also act as a additional information for the validation so the covaxin trial is a placebo control uh, trial a double blind trial and that's happening and we'll get those results very soon it is now being administered in what the drug controller has called clinical trial mode in that there is no placebo arm but each person who is administered will be followed up very carefully over time and they will probably also see whether such people are infected or not so there is that element of you know follow up which is different from the covid shield vaccine so that's the way it is structured right now one question from mr arvind kumar developed countries like japan is still hesitant for clinical trials on their land is it not kind of biasing and safeguarding their population from a possible impact due to vaccine side effects i'm not sure that japan is against clinical trials in their land so that question is moot they don't have had enough coronavirus cases to be able to do clinical trials of phase 3 uh, which requires a prevalence of infections but i don't think japan is negative about clinical trials in the land 
So one question from Mr. Akash Gupta. If the virus undergoes multiple mutations to such an extent that it renders the vaccine developed ineffective, then in such scenario, how will be prepared to develop another vaccine? This is a very important question. So far, the variants which we have seen do not make them vaccine escape, though some variant, one variant is likely to have features of being uh, having vaccine or immune escape. Now, what would one do? Because we know what the change is, we can make corresponding changes. So that's changes in the key. We can make corresponding changes in the lock so that the fit is still there. But we don't necessarily have to go through the entire process of trials again. We just need to show that the change which we made in the vaccine is effective against this new variant because all and the fundamental other aspects have not changed. So the deployment of new vaccines against new variants which need it uh, will not be that difficult. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, these are the questions I received till now. If anything is there, we'll forward it to your office, sir. Ram Sirish, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Raghavan, Vijay Raghavan a question. So there yes, has sir. been a lot of discussion uh, in informed circles that perhaps uh, countries where VCG vaccination was universal, that there has been a lower prevalence of COVID. Uh, what is your view on that? Well, the BCG vaccine has got uh, two components. One, it is a vaccination against tuberculosis. And over many tests, over many years, it is found to be effective against childhood tuberculosis, but not against adult tuberculosis. And the reason is that its effectiveness seems to go down. That's why vaccines against tuberculosis, as I said earlier, have continued to be a challenge. BCG also acts as a general immunity booster, and there has been a major trial going on whether that is sufficient against SARS coronavirus 2 in a placebo controlled trial, but we don't have the results of those yet. So far, there is no evidence to suggest that BCG works against SARS coronavirus 2. There have been many countries, including India, where BCG has been used widely, and the numbers of infections have been very, very large. So one more question I received from Mr. Jitin. Yes, sir, great oration. I am Jitin from SCTI MST. I do have a concern. How long will it take to do an effective vaccination regime so that we have an adequate immunity in our population? What is the government's stand in this? So the question is how many people need to be vaccinated and how long will it take so that the population is significantly protected? Population is protected by two ways. Those who have the disease and therefore are protected and they protect those who they surround and those who get the vaccination so that they are protected and they protect who they surround. What is the minimum number which needs to be vaccinated or infected in total in such a manner to provide, provide effectively what is called herd immunity. Now that depends a lot on the nature of the virus. Given the SARS coronavirus, virus, the estimates vary from 60% of the population or so are likely to be sufficient to be vaccinated to have population level immunity. But if there are new variants which are transmitted even faster, that number will change. It will go up to 70. If the variants are extremely fast transmitted, it could go up even more. So this is a dynamic number and not a property of the vaccine or a property of the virus, but a property of their interaction with us. So, question received from Mr. Sulab Gupta. What explains the decline in COVID cases in India? And what is the status of herd immunity in India? So there have been multiple views about how herd immunity can develop. As I said, I just answered that question. And the question is that are the declining cases due to a substantial level of infection already having taken place? It's possible that that has had some impact. I think that certainly could be the case that the level of prevalence uh, amongst a young population who don't show symptoms may be high and so they uh, you know, are protected. The other very uh, other possibility is that masks and distancing have quelled the spread of the virus for a sufficiently long time, so its prevalence is low. And the third is, which there's no basis right now, one way or the other, is that there is something, you know, 
um, which uh, prevents the spread of virus in our population, but there's no evidence, as I said, one way or the other for that. And finally, our you know healthcare system is such that we have been ta- able to take care of those who are likely to be transmitting because maybe the transmission is not uniform, as I said, it's in pockets, and you've taken care of those major pockets of transmission. While all this may be true as potential explanations for decline, one should be very careful against new kinds of threats which might emerge. Question from Professor Svarlalata Jagarlapudi. Year on year, we are coming up with various vaccines, and today vaccines are running in double digit. Is there a possibility to merge the vaccines to come out with a super vaccine, which would cover various diseases? We do that often. Many vaccination programs mix multiple vaccines or multiple types. For example, there are viruses which have many variants in them, and you have, you know, bivalent, trivalent, or pentavalent vaccines which combine vaccination against multiple variants or against multiple pathogens. Certainly, as the vaccination program um, rolls out, this is certainly feasible. <coughs> Second question from Professor Svanalata. Pandemic has created the need for scientific awareness among us all sections of society. How are we going to achieve this goal with the given literacy levels in our country? Awareness is not only a factor of literacy. Uh, some of the very highly literate countries have shown extraordinarily poor awareness. Uh, literacy is, of course, a major challenge which needs to be tackled, but awareness cuts, or the lack of it, cuts across social and economic strata, as we have seen in the West. Uh, better communication, identifying what is fake and what is not, uh, understanding the foundational basis of science, all of that is very important. That's why I started my talk by talking about evolution and the history of human development and the history of disease. These are the kinds of areas which all of us need to understand. And many extremely literate, very well-to-do people don't grasp this and they come up with all sorts of uh, views which uh, many illiterate people don't have. Next question from Professor Svanalat, sir. Sir, what about the efforts taken by GOI to build national immunity? Can we rope in Ayush in this endeavor? I think I already answered that. When we better talk about Ayush drugs. Yeah. Sir, question from Ms. Venkat Trauma Upadhyaya. Whether vaccines have been hastily approved without establishing safety and efficacy, how does one explain the deaths of a few health workers soon after being vaccinated? I answer that, but I'll repeat that. The safety trials of the vaccines which have been approved are very rigorous, and the efficacy data for COVID shield is available internationally, and there's a bridging trial data, intermediate data, which is available. For COVAXIN, we have very high levels of safety data, and we have immunogenicity data, and we have efficacy data in non-human primates. And the efficacy data from phase three trials will be coming soon, And overall, the drug controller has taken a view that given the kinds of pandemic situation we have, emergency use authorization needs to be done. The deaths which you refer to have nothing to do with the vaccine. And as I said, in a very large population, people will die every day. In, you know, 100,000 people, for example, uh, there will be 10 people who die every day, whether you give them a vaccine or not. And therefore, relating vaccine, post-vaccine deaths as being caused by vaccine is something which has to be investigated. So there will be deaths, there will be headaches, there will be stomach aches, there will be all sorts of issues, but we need to investigate each to see whether they're caused by the vaccine or unrelated to the vaccine, right? Just as if you have, people have breakfast every day, everyone who has a breakfast one day, millions of people, amongst them, some people will die the next day. But it doesn't mean that the breakfast caused their death. You have to investigate whether it did or not. Vaccines have been given are being given to healthy people. There's an extraordinary amount of diligence about their safety. They are much, much, much safer, safer than what you would deal with by taking an aspirin, for example, even. But every case of an adverse event has to be investigated and analyzed to make sure it's not caused by the vaccine. 
That's why large-scale rollouts are always done in a very watchful manner. Even if there's a low frequency, that needs to be checked and established, and that's what we've done. So question from Megan Agarwal. Can the vaccine can compete with new COVID variant found in London? Now, the, that has to be actually tested, whether that it happens or not. And very recently, Covaxin has been tested specifically against the variant, and it works quite well. And the expectation is the others also will work. Thank you, sir. These are the questions I received till now. So now it is the time for memento presentation. Now I request our chairman, Sri Padmanabhaya, to present the memento to the speaker, which will be delivered to your officer and and for the closing remarks, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, for your uh, lucid, clear, and simplified. Uh, uh, exposition of a very difficult technical subject. You have done extremely well and you have very patiently answered all the questions, some of them uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, irrelevant, I thought. But uh, anyway, uh, as far as I am concerned, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I said about this uh, vaccine uh, hesitancy. I myself said in the initial stages, which is bound to be there, and it happens everywhere. One need not be sort of worried about it. But the question I had was, uh, the, why is that hesitancy coming from a section of the medical community? That is the question I wanted. But you answered in different ways, so I won't uh, press you on that. The second point uh, which uh, I was making is, it's more of administrative uh, matter, nothing to do with uh, scientific, uh, this one. I was saying after people get vaccinated, for about uh, 10 days or a week, in case there, they must have free and easy access to follow up care and a particular, you know, setup, whatever is the setup. Because uh, uh, you can't every day go back to the vaccination center. There has to be some follow up. You yourself have emphasized this that uh, after the uh, vaccination, there has to be a follow up because people would be worried. Uh, so I think that has to be built in. It's an administrative uh, matter, it doesn't really. Uh, sort of is not in your area of operation. But uh, all said and done, it has been a, an excellent uh, uh, learning opportunity for us. And thank you very much for taking time off. And then this is a small formality. I am supposed to present this uh, memento to you. There is a beautifully uh, sort of carved, uh, etched uh, image of uh, uh, this one, uh, the Charminar of Hyderabad. But um, you being in Delhi and I being in Hyderabad, I can't give it to you. We would arrange to send it to you. And thank you very much for your, uh, sparing your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Well, Wonderful and relaxing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So this is the end of the program today. Uh, before closing, I would like to inform you all about the upcoming lecture by Dr. Vinod K. Paul, member Niti Ayur, on 3rd of February at 11.30 a.m. on the topic management of COVID pandemic, vaccine procurement development in India. Hope all of you will join again us. Thank you.